like to introduce Professor Bhattacharya. I think some of you may have had him at various courses. Um, but he has a, both an MBA and PhD. Um, the MBA is from Indiana, Indian, <laughs> Indian Institute of Technology, and PhD from Columbia. So and he's been with Kelly since 1997. Um, he is an associate professor of finance, and he also served as a visiting associate professor at various other schools such as Chicago Booth and MIT. So very well versed in a lot of different programs. Um, his research has been featured worldwide, in lots of different publications and media channels, with a lot of focus on the dark side of finance, which is what he's going to be presenting to us today. And an interesting tidbit is that he teaches in a different country every summer, which I think is really cool. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. So I gave the same talk last year to the same group, and I have the sneaking suspicion that I may have to give it again next year. <laughs> so I might as well get this videotape so I don't have to give this again anymore. <laughs> so what we are going to do here is uh, develop this theme called the dark side of finance. Uh, since you guys are in the Capital Markets Academy and uh, many of you may be wearing rose tinted spectacles where I'm sure you are not because every day some hanky panky is going on. So I'd like to present the other side of finance which I think is equally important. And it's also the object of my research. So much of this story is going to be an autobiographical adventure into the dark side of finance. So here's the plan. First, I'll try to convince you that the thing that drives capitalism is trust. And without trust, there is no capitalism. Then I will give you examples using my own personal perspective of breaches of trust. It starts from a very personal thing and goes on to the breaches of trust in financial markets. Then, uh, since we are in finance, we will show that this has consequences. In financial markets, trust is priced. So honesty seems to be the best policy. Firms which are honest seem to have better prices. And then I'll conclude by wrapping up everything and talking to you about what I really mean by the dark side of finance. So let's begin by trust. There is a creation of wealth all over the world and the only person who creates the wealth irrespective of what these political candidates are saying is an entrepreneur. She's the person with a good idea and she wants to develop the idea and make it commercial and she's constrained by the amount of capital that she can raise. She can use her own money but soon she runs out of it so she borrows from family and friends but soon they will say, well, we can't give you any more. So these are limited sources of capital. So the maximum number of businesses in the world today are family businesses, small mom and pop, or some large family businesses. And the major reason why that is so is because no one else would give them money. There are very few of them who would like to be family businesses, but they would like to raise money too, but no one would. So, if you want to become big, if you want to achieve your potential, you have to fund the growth using other people's money. So, here's my claim. All big investments in the world have used, will use, and will continue to use other people's money. Now, ask yourself a fundamental question. Why the hell would a stranger lend you money? He doesn't know you. So how has society resolved this problem in the last thousands of years? Well, they're private contracts. You write a contract, I give you money, return it with an interest or some fiduciary responsibilities. And these contracts are enforced in the courts. So there's public regulation. Some countries have better contract enforcement and some have less. So this is the enforcement and countries which have less legal enforcement and less commercial law also have more family businesses. 
But at the end of the day, it's trust, honor, morals. I give you money and I expect to give it, get it back with a return. There is a fiduciary responsibility. I'm not the first person who's giving you this idea. It was first breached by none other than the person who wrote the Bible on capitalism, Adam Smith. Everyone cites the wealth of nations. Very few people cite or read the theory of moral sentiments. It says the same thing, which is morality has an essential role in capitalism. So, if there is no trust, there is no capitalism. A recent example, 2008, beginning of the big financial crisis in the world. I did a little bit of a back of the envelope calculation today. About $10 trillion of wealth vanished in the last few years because of a fall in confidence. People are not investing in risky assets because they don't think they'll get their money back. So they just want safe assets and interest rates almost all over the world are nearing zero. So, let's start the second chapter of this talk, which is my personal perspective. I was born in this country called India, which is the world's largest democracy and the second largest country in terms of population. <coughs> and, and also, one of the world's most corrupt countries. Now, I grew up in the state called Bihar, which is the most corrupt state in a very corrupt country. So let me give you an incident from my life. When I graduated from high school, I got a letter from the federal government saying that I did very well. I was entitled to a scholarship, but since my parents' income was above a certain critical amount, I couldn't get that scholarship, so they would give me a cash award instead, which is fine, fair enough. I got that letter in 1975, it's 2012 today, I haven't yet got the cash award. <laughs> so I've been writing to them sometimes in English, sometimes in Hindi which is the national language and many many years later I actually got a response from them from Delhi saying that they have sent my award and all my paperwork to the state capital here and I could collect it from there anytime I go there. Now, why would I go to Patna just to collect a small cash award? But once I was on a business trip just before I came to the United States and they had sent me to Patna. So I had an afternoon to spare and I went down to the government office, the state government office and I asked them whether I could see my files and get my cash award. So there was a person sitting outside and this person said, yeah, but I need a bribe. So I said, how much do you need? He said 200 rupees. I said, are you out of your mind? Why will I get, give you 200 rupees when my cash award is only 100 rupees? So I give you 200 to get 100? He said, yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? I said, no, it doesn't. And then he looked at his list again and said, but that's my rate. So I realized that when corruption reaches such a systemic thing, it soon becomes irrational. So that was 1958 through 84. I come to the United States, do graduate work and get my first job and get my first grant from the US State Department and they send me to Russia. It was the year 1993, two years after the Soviet Union collapsed. So the United States thought that they could change Soviet Union and uh, Russia and make it very capitalistic. And there were these grants available for people to teach economics, business and so on and so forth. So I got a grant to teach finance and there were two conditions, go to places where no one ever goes which is here, south of Russia, Caucasus mountains, very beautiful, very small towns and you have to take six American MBA students with you, teach them how to teach. So they also go with you and teach all these various discipline. So we taught accounting and MIS and I was doing the finance and a little bit of economics. So we were going town to town, teaching in the evenings and becoming very popular and of course drinking vodka we, we, till the wee hours of the morning. Now these students were all taking part in a Ponzi scheme. 
And the Ponzi scheme was something like this. There was a guy called Sergei Mavrodi who were telling the Russians that if you invest $100 with me right now, I'll double your money in a month. And all my students were taking part. I said, guys, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is not going to last. It's too good to be true. He'll run away with your money. Don't invest. And they looked at me quizzically and they said, everyone is investing. Even Yeltsin is investing. The entire country is investing. If something happens, they will bail us out. Hmm. Anyway, something did happen when I came back. The whole scheme collapsed. Sergei Mavrodi, they st started searching for him. They found him. And he said he would stand for the Russian parliament, the Duma. And if he gets elected, they'll get their money back. So they elected him. Of course, they didn't get their money back. But an interesting thing about the Russian parliament is, if you're a member of parliament, you can't be prosecuted. So for five years, he was immune from prosecution. He lost the next elections and he's disappeared. They're still trying to find him. So I came back. And I found out the following thing. Such schemes were going on not just in Russia, but in just about every of the ex-communist communist countries which had collapsed. So they were happening in Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia then, but now Czech and then Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, and last but not the least in Albania, the biggest one of them. And when the scheme collapsed, it led to a civil war. And the war, in a sense, still continues today. So what was common amongst all these schemes was there was this guy called some guy called Sergei Mavrodi who had involved the political class and was running this thing and just about the whole country had taken part. So being trained as a theorist in graduate school I said you know this is very interesting because all of you who do finance know that bubbles and stock markets cannot exist because one day that bubble is going to crash. So it's like a Ponzi scheme. You're on the last round and you say, you know, this is too good to be true. This will collapse. So I'm not putting my money in here. So you don't take part. So the last round disappears. If you're in the second to last round, you say, you know, there is no last round. I'm now the last round. So I'll disappear too. So if you assume rationality, Ponzi schemes and bubbles cannot exist in efficient markets. And therefore, this is one of the dictums of classical finance. You cannot have a Ponzi scheme where there is a last round. So the only time you can have a Ponzi scheme, and of course, I wouldn't like to call it a Ponzi scheme, but any place where the one generation feeds into the other generation is where the time goes on forever, like social security. But if there is a last round, there cannot be a Ponzi scheme. Or can there? So I said, there's something weird about these ex-communist countries. And here was my explanation. Suppose you're in the last round and you say, if I put in $100, I'm going to lose it for sure. But there will be a bailout. I'll get some of it back. So let me say I get $50 back. So I lose $50. And then I say, suppose I don't take part. If I don't take part, I won't lose anything. But heck, there's all this wealth lying around. The government has just co collapsed. No one knows who has property rights. They will use my taxpayer money to bail those guys out and I'll lose $50. So I might as well take part. So the point I was making is that bailout is a transfer of wealth from people who did not take part to people who took part and makes these Ponzi schemes actually rational. So I wrote on this paper and of course, none of the top journals in finance accepted it. They said, this is like a fable. This can't happen. I said, it did happen in these ex-communist countries. And finally, it did get accepted. And the point again was, it's a cynical exploitation of the too big to fail doctrine, because everyone's taking part, by a private citizen usurping the powers of the state. It leads to private money backed by public assets. There are all these assets lying around there. The government has just collapsed. No one knows who owns it. And this is a great way to steal. It leads to eventual collapse. Now you may ask, why is this stopped? Well, it doesn't stop because there are no police force. The whole country is in chaos. There is this enforcement problem. 
But when it collapses, then everyone is very upset. The coordination problem is solved, and this is a picture from CNN. Protests broke out in Albania several weeks ago after fraudulent pyramid investment schemes failed stripping many Albanians of their life savings. They go to the Times Square, uh, to the square, the city square, and they demand their money back. Well, now a lot of people are reading that paper, and I wrote a satire on the paper after I saw what happened in the year 2008. Notice there was a big crisis here too, the subprime mortgage crisis, which led to many other things. And notice again, very few people are talking about that, but I was incensed. There was a bailout. And what is a bailout? It's taxpayers' money being bailed out, given to people who brought us there in the first place. So for them, it's heads I win, tails you lose. So these bailouts lead to very bad incentives and they lead to these bubbles. Besides, of course, the moral perspective on bailouts. Okay, second country, and I'm coming to that. While I was in Russia, there was this class on market efficiency. And in this class, I was telling my students, you know, markets are efficient when prices mean something. So they used to ask me, how can prices mean something? Who in Moscow or St. Petersburg tells prices to mean something? I said, no, no, no. It means that if a price goes up, the firm must be doing well. If the price goes down, the firm is doing badly. They said, how does this happen? So I almost tore off my hair. Those days I used to have more hair. And I said, I have to illustrate this somehow. And I remembered something from grad school, which is an experiment I used to run with my advisors. And the experiment went something like this. It was based on a classic experiment by Charlie Plot and Sundar. An experiment which led them to one of them to get a Nobel Prize, which leads to experimental economics. What's the experiment? To simplify it, students come to your class, and I played it in the MBA class here as well. About 90% of them get a piece of paper which says, five minutes from now, God is going to come down to earth. If you're not a believer, nature will tell you that this piece of paper is worth $20 or it's worth zero dollars. Five percent of the students are told that it's twenty dollars for sure. So the students are told, you know, life's not fair. There are some insiders who know for sure, but most of us are outsiders. We don't know who the insiders are because these were randomly shuffled pieces of paper. So it's anonymous. We don't know who they are. We don't know how many there are. There may be one insider, two insider, all the class may be an insider, or there may be no insiders. And we don't know what they know. They may have good news or they may have bad news. So we don't know what they know, we don't know how many there are, and we don't know who they are. But we'll trade. They said, trade? How do we trade? So I said, well, I'll be a market maker. We'll set up the trading flow as in the New York Stock Exchange. I'll quote you bid prices and ask prices. So they said, what's an ask price and a bid price? So I said, ask price is the price that you will buy from me. Bid price is the price that you will sell to me. And since I'm an outsider, let me figure this out. $20 half the time, $0 half the time. So it's $10. So I think the value is 10. So that's my estimate of the value. So if you want to buy from me, I'll charge you ten and a half dollars. And if you want to sell to me, I'll give you only nine and a half dollars because this one dollar spread is my profit. I said, okay. How do you play? So they say, I told them, you can buy from me one share at a time. And you can short to me one share at a time. So they said, what is shorting? Oh, I said, shorting is something that you can only do in finance. You can sell things you do not own. I said, they said, how do you do that? I said, you borrow it, sell it right now, and then return it later by buying it back. Okay, now what? I said, double-sided auction. I said, what the hell is that? They said, I said, well, if you want to buy it from me, the person who wants to give me the highest price, I'll honor him. He's in first in line. 
And if you want to sell to me, the person who wants to sell it to me at the lowest price will be honored as well, no one else. So that's a double-sided auction. In the real world, they stand in line. It's like a computerized price priority. And finally, here are the playoffs. If you say buy it at $11, and five minutes from now, nature reveals that it's $20. You bought it at 11 it's 20 I'll take out my wallet, and I'll give you 9 However, if it becomes zero, you lose your eleven dollars. They said this is risky. I said yes, trading is a risky business. Shorting, if you short it at eight, that means you sell it at eight, and it's revealed that it's twenty dollars five minutes from now, you have to buy it back at twenty, so you lose twelve dollars. You take out your wallet and you give me twelve dollars. And if it falls to zero, you win eight. So risky shorting is risky too. Guys, ready? He said, we are ready. Let's play. Let's play. Start playing. Remember, about 5% of them, them knew that it was $20 for sure. So they didn't have any risk. They said, buy, 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 buy. In about 90 seconds, the price reached $19.95. The Russians may not know finance, but they are rational and greedy like all of us. Even outsiders figured out that there was good news. So they also started saying, buy, 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 buy. And the price went up to 19.95. And when it's revealed that it's $20, the price jumps up by 5 cents. So I explained to my Russian students, this is what we mean by market efficiency. The stock price, which is $19.95, revealed almost everything that the insider knew. No one in Moscow or St. Petersburg told prices to reveal that. It was rationality and greed and the existence of a free market. And that was the point that Frederick Hayek had made in the 1940s, where he had predicted that socialism cannot survive because you do not allow free markets to exist, and this role disappears. This price is a summary of all information in the all traders, which is better than any information anyone has in St. Petersburg or Moscow. So they were very impressed. So was I. I didn't expect it to that experiment to be so successful. So I came back to the United States and started playing this game with my undergraduate students and MBA students. And since 1993, as Francisco and Elise would say, I played it right this year, and the same thing happens. So why am I bringing up all of this? Because a few years later, one of my students, Brian Jorgensen, undergraduate student, came up to me and said, Professor Bhattacharya, what you just did may actually happen in the real world. I said, Brian, it can't happen in the real world. In my class, I encouraged all these insiders to trade. In the real world, insider trading is illegal. He said, not in my wife's country. I said, Mexico, but I just translated the insider trading law from the Spanish in Mexico. It's exactly the same as the U.S. insider trading law, it's cut and paste. He said, yeah, but no one follows it. No one's ever caught. So I asked, Brian, what are you doing this summer? I said, I'm going to Mexico. Brian, can you do me something? When Mexican companies make news announcements in Mexico, see what happens. So three or four companies had made news announcements. Remember what happened in my classroom, 1995? And then it went to 20, nothing happened. Because the prices had become almost strong from efficient. So he came back and said, in Mexico, nothing happened. So I got two of my grad students together with Brian and me. And those were the old, bad old days at Indiana University where the only Bloomberg terminal was a terminal that the MBAs had. And you had a special MBA lab, which we were not allowed to use. Of course, I had inside information and inside sources. So the MBA director was a good friend of mine. He said, you can use it but after the MBAs leave at 9 p.m. So we were there from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. for five nights, downloading every news announcement that came out in Mexico. And what did you find? Nothing happens. When corporations made news announcements in Mexico in the years 94 through 97, nothing happened to the share prices. There was no event. Very strange. When companies make good news, prices are supposed to go up. 
when they make bad news, prices are supposed to go down. Not in Mexico, because prices had almost become strong form and efficient. So the conclusion was there was rampant insider trading. Now, if you write a serious paper, they will hire serious defense lawyers. So Indiana University got scared and they said, "Ah, uh ah, -uh, we may get sued." So the title of the paper was. When an event is not an event, the curious case of Mexico, the lawyers asked us to change the name of the paper to when an event is not an event, the curious case of an emerging market. Anyway, that was a name change. And of course, it's a serious paper, so there are other, way, other reasons why this may happen, so we had to discount all the other hypotheses as well, and the paper got published. But the media picked it up, first the Wall Street Journal, but specifically the Mexican media, and that's when I realized that research does have ramifications. So they asked the president of the Mexican stock market to comment on our paper and he said no comment. Never ever say no comment, you should say things like that's crap or something like that. <laughs> well in a few months uh, lots of things happened. Uh, from what I hear is that he was, he was gone but I don't think it's because of our paper. So that was Mexico. So Brian goes back, that's a great job, and now he's running his own business. One of the graduate students go back to Germany. But one of them remains here, Hazem. And both of us feel very guilty because Hazem's from France and I'm from India and the United States and Mexico is not a country. He said, you know, this doesn't look good bashing Mexico. So what we should do is bash the whole world. So he went to the Indian University libraries and asked, the following question, how many countries have insider trading laws and how many countries have enforced these laws and they told us they don't have this information. And I asked the librarian, can you find this out for us? He said, sure, they're very helpful there. So he called up the Library of Congress in Harvard and the Library of Congress is the best library in the United States and they said they don't have this information. Okay, so for the next three years of our lives, we sent emails faxes, letters and phone calls to every country in the world that had a stock market. So in the year 2000 there were 203 countries asking them, do you have a law against insider trading? B, yes. If yes, has anyone ever gone to jail? 103 countries, we got responses from five of them. Hong Kong, Canada, United States and two more, I don't remember. I said, you know, you can't do a research with five countries and these are the honest countries, so we have to get answers from all of them. So that's why we had to spend three years pestering all of them, reminding them, remember what happened in the case of Mexico? Should give us the information we are seeking. One country which I shall not even name even asked us, what is insider trading? Anyway, so this is the finding from that paper. The number of countries in the 20th century increases after the Second World War because of all these colonies are getting independent and then increases after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Of these countries, how many have stock markets? So these are the countries with stock markets. Of the countries with stock markets, how many have a law against insider trading? First one third of the century, none. 1933, US is the first country to have a law banning insider trading. 1966, France. And today, all rich countries have a law banning insider trading and 80% of the poorer countries have it. So no one likes insider trading. But the funny thing is, has anyone ever gone to jail or been prosecuted? First two thirds of the century, no one. Again, the first country to prosecute is the United States in 1961. Today, quite a few countries are prosecuted. Four out of five of the rich countries have, but just one out of four of the poorer countries have. So, take away. No one likes insider trading, but they don't seem to do anything about it. So, the findings are the existence and the enforcement of insider trading laws is a phenomenon of the 1990s. It's all happened in the 1990s. The easy part which is passing a law and most cases cutting and pasting from the US law is done by most countries. 
The difficult part, the political will to enforce these laws, is done by only a few countries. And of course, by far, the country which does it the most is the United States, which has about four prosecutions every month. And yesterday, for example, we had the previous boss of McKinsey and then a director of Goldman going to jail for two years. This doesn't happen in any other country, by the way. U.S. is an outlier. So that was the paper for which I'm most cited for, my home run paper. It's called The World Price of Insider Trading. Then a friend and also an ex-student called me up, Mike Welker from Canada, and he said, Utpal, can we do something in accounting? Now, Mike, to his credit, was perhaps the first person I know who knew that something like Enron and WorldCom was going to happen a year before that. So he said he was developing these perspectives on earnings manipulation and he needed my help on the finance side of it. So this is a cartoon he sent me, two and two is four again. So I said, Mike, I have no idea of how to do accounting, specifically how do you measure earnings hanky-panky? So he said, come to Canada. I went to Queen's University at Ontario and he showed me this wonderful graph. He said in accounting, there are three measures. So let's take the United States. The bold line is the actual distribution of earnings per share in the United States. The dotted line is what they report. So everyone shades it upwards. So this concept is called earnings aggressiveness. Second dimension, again the bold line is the truth, but what's reported is this distribution. There's something very kinky and weird around the number zero. A lot of firms report small positive profits and very few firms report small negative losses. Now why is that? The hypothesis is that you manipulate your earnings, no one wants to show that they have had a loss. So if you have a small loss, you manipulate it to show a small profit. But if you have a big loss, it's difficult to manipulate it to show a profit. So therefore, there's some weird things going around number zero. And the last dimension that they talk about is earnings smoothing, which is this is the distribution. But no one wants to report every year volatile earnings, so they want to smooth it. So therefore, this is the smooth earning. So Mike said, you know, we can actually do this for various countries of the world for which we have data. We can measure all these distortions. So I said, Mike, one question though. I know what's reported, but how do you know what the truth was? So he said, well, we in accounting have these things called accruals. So there's a very tortured way of for them to find out what the truth is. Basically, the idea is cash profits are the truth and reported profits are what is reported. So what did you find? Well, we found of all the 42 countries we studied, or 41, firms in all countries fudge their numbers, some more so, some less. Good news, the US fudges it the least. So then Enron and WorldCom broke, and we had a very funny reporter who said, don't worry guys, this happens in every country, it happens the least here. So the US fudges the least, and, if, and I think the country which fudged the most in our sample that time was China. Okay. The next paper is, do you remember who that is? Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart. <laughs> 2001, Forbes reported her net worth to $650 million. That was an interesting year because she went to jail that year. She would have been indicted for insider trading, but the evidence was not strong enough for a criminal conviction. So the, she was indicted for perjury, for lying about it, and went to jail for six months. But she did have a civil trial, and this is what we found, where the burden of proof is much lower. Her insider trading profits were $45,000. So like many people, I was wondering, this doesn't make sense. Such a rich woman, $650 million, and she risks her entire reputation for 450 It's about, what, 0.008%? 
So Cassandra was a grad student of mine and I said, let's check this for all other people who have been indicted and prosecuted in US law. So he went to 30 years of data to find out whether Martha Stewart was an outlier or was she an average person. We found she was an average person. Convicted insiders do not seem to do it for the money, which was very, very strange. And the way we had pitched the paper is the following, that Gary Becker, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for very unconventional thinking, and one of his thinking was the economic motive of crime. So think of crime as an economic behavior. You commit a crime if the benefit exceeds the cost. Okay, forget mor morality. So if you're a poor guy, the extra dollar means a lot to you. So that's the benefit. And if you get caught, you go to jail, but you don't have much income, you don't have much reputation, so the cost is much lower. So marginal benefit is much higher, marginal cost is much lower, so that theory predicts that the poorer guys should be committing the most crimes, which is true as you see in blue collar crimes and, and the jails. No one had studied this for white collar crimes. And we found that in white collar crimes, it's actually a little more complicated. That's not true. There may be other motives like arrogance or hubris. We didn't investigate that further, but we said economics is not the main motive for white collar crime. Okay. The paper which I just concluded with Professor Poole, Veronica Poole, who is a finance department assistant professor and a grad student who just joined Tulane University was an investigation of the 11 trillion dollar US mutual fund industry. Our insight was the following. General Electric is a conglomerate. So like all conglomerates in the world or Chinese business groups or Indian business groups, they are various segments and they cross subsidize each other. They have an insurance pool and that's one of the major reasons why conglomerates exist. Our insight was if you look at mutual funds in the United States or anywhere in the world, they are also are conglomerates like Fidelity offers so many mutual funds, Vanguard offers so many mutual funds. So surely they must be doing some cross subsidy too. Now in the case of General Electric or any of the Indian or Chinese business groups, this is legal. For mutual funds it's not legal because a mutual fund owes its responsibility to its own shareholders. It doesn't have any responsibility towards its family. So we were poking around to figure out if there is any cross subsidy. And again, we were not the first person who has been trying to do that. Many, many researchers have been trying to do that for tens of years now. Well, we had a data set which actually allowed us to see that. I was just painstakingly collected by Jamun by many drives to Purdue University which had that data set, but no one ever thought of checking that out. So here's a graph from that. So every a typical quarter, in a typical family, there are funds which are flush with liquidity and there are funds where everyone's redeeming their shares. So this is the most distressed and this is the least distressed. So there are 10 decents. So this is flush with liquidity and this is liquidity scarce. And this of course everyone's redeemed their shares, most distressed. Y axis is what headquarters are doing. Where's headquarter help coming to? Notice what headquarters are doing. They are putting most of their money in the most distressed fund. So they are helping it out. Is this creating an alpha? No, it is creating a negative alpha. So they are actually subsidizing the most distressed fund. So we wrote this paper up. It got accepted in Finance's top journals, Journal of Finance. Not that important, but what is important is the industry newsletter rammed our paper saying, ah, this is, they don't know what they are talking about, this can't happen, blah, 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 blah. It was very critical of our paper. They have to be. And Fidelity invited Veronica to present this paper. The Fidelity boss said, I don't believe this. And Veronica said, give me an alternative interpretation of that result. And he said, well, 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 it doesn't happen in Fidelity, it may happen somewhere else. Anyway, with all that press, not press, the flag that we got, what would have happened? The Securities and Exchange Commission got interested. They called me, I presented this and today I have done something that I have never done in my life. 
I've now signed up to be an official whistleblower for the federal government against the $11 trillion US industry. And of course, if we win, I'll get very rich. We get to keep 30% of this. I'll hold the questions later. So finding mutual fund families seem to illegally cross subsidized distress funds. And we may be wrong. They may have some other explanation. So let's see. Okay. Third part. Is trust priced? Remember, I'm in finance. So this is not a legal talk. It's not a moral talk. To me, the most, perhaps the most important question is, does it affect dollars and cents? And these are the findings from many of the papers. For the world price of insider trading paper, this I think is my biggest finding, which is, it's not the law stupid, it's the enforcement that counts. So whenever a country passes a law, nothing happens to its share prices. But when someone goes to jail, its share prices go up. So that's in terms of prices. In terms of cost of capital, it's the other way around. Nothing happens to the cost of capital. When someone actually goes to jail, the cost of capital goes down, which means its cost of borrowing goes down. Another paper extended this even further. It was a paper which was called, When No Law is Better Than a Good Law. We found that if a country passes a law, but does not enforce it, its share price keeps going down. So it's better for it not to have passed the law and not enforce it than to have passed the law but not enforce it. Now you'd ask, why is that? And here's the answer. And the metaphor is guns. If you have a society where there is a very strict gun law and strictly enforced, then no one has guns, it's peaceful perhaps. But think of a society where you have a gun law, which is you can't have guns, but you don't enforce it. So in that society, the good guys will not have guns because it's against the law. The bad guys will have guns because no one enforces it. So in that society, the good guys are actually worse off than in the Wild West, where at least they could have protected themselves. Now in a financial situation, insider trading and all these market manipulations is like guns. They hurt other people, but they do protect you. So they have a positive internality. So I repeat again. It's better not to have a law than to have a law but not enforce it. It had radical policy implications because the World Bank, the State Department, the IMF were telling all these poor countries, copy US laws. And we were saying, you know, that's a bad idea unless it's enforced. Because all they'll do is cut and paste and put it in their books to get the loan amounts. So the conclusion was dangerous to pass a good law unless you mean to enforce it. What about the accounting paper? So earnings hanky panky. We found all those three dimensions that I talked about is correlated positively with cost of borrowing and negatively with liquidity, which is countries which have more hanky panky in the earnings opacity, have higher cost of borrowing, that means lower prices, and also have lower liquidity. In conclusion, transparency is rewarded. So all these papers are having the following theme that honesty is the best policy even in terms of dollars and cents. So, I conclude by saying, what is the dark side of finance then? I'll link it with my first slide. Finance is about using other people's money, bonds, stocks. And if you're in Germany or Japan or in the United States, it's difficult to visualize that, but opportunities to breach fiduciary responsibility Breach fiduciary responsibility is a legal term. Opportunities to steal are strong. There's lots of money to be made. Think of inside, you get a tip, you can make millions of dollars. It's very easy. Humans are gullible. Think they understand finance, but most, they do, most do not. Just see what happened in the subprime mortgage crisis. Taking on loans that you thought you could pay, because you thought house prices can never fall. And of course, they cannot all be eliminated by law because morals cannot be legislated. So the dark side of finance has been there, is there, and will continue to be there. Thank you very much. I'll take questions, sir.
Yeah, yeah they were. I was going to ask if you were going to, with the sign up for whistleblower, if you said to. What's that? Fit financially, but clearly you answered that. Pretty yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Uh, with the wisdom of hindsight, it was uh, not such a financially wise decision because I, my friend, some of my friends said you should have signed up as a consultant because then you'll make money whatever happens. But now I only make money if we win. It's like a contingency fee. <laughs> yes. Um, I was just wondering about, so you were talking about the motivation about white collar crimes not being economic. Um, do you think there's some truth to the, the idea that um, that's more just how they got there in the first place by cutting corners and, and being overly aggressive? Um, and so it's not necessarily they put everything on this one one little risk they took. It's how they, you know, it's how they amassed their wealth in the first place. That's an extremely valid observation and a great statement. I concede that point, which is that it's just that you're seeing a time and a place where they have got caught. Mm -hmm. They may have been doing this all their lives and that's how they became very rich. So this is what we call the self-selection bias. So that criticism is very valid. Yeah, that's true. Yes. I think that experiment about in Russia with selling and buying the zero to twenty dollar coupons. Um, you think it would, I mean, it would have been cool if somebody would have, who, who was an insider and it was worth $20 would have sold with everything they had and, and pushed the market down. Like, Actually, uh, some, some people, so since I, so two things I should mention. Uh, people have been thinking about this manipulation, including in my MBA class now, which is manipulating this thing by selling it. It doesn't quite work because uh, not many people, so people are first scared of to take part. And so if you have a very liquid market and a lot of people are taking part, perhaps this manipulation works. It doesn't work quite well at work in the classroom setting. And my second uh, observation is that people now have heard of my experiment. So I've had an interesting situation in Singapore this time where these insiders banded together and colluded and said, Let's not say anything. So they had an equilibrium where no one would bid anything and the price would go for ten dollars and then I would lose my ten dollars for sure and then they will share it amongst themselves. What happens is that equilibrium is not sustainable. These guys make an agreement out, outside the class that well, if we are an insider we won't speak up. They come to the class and greed overwhelms them and they say ah because they want to beat the other guy. So that equilibrium is not sustainable. So that manipulation is not sustainable. But your manipulation, which is trying to put the price down and things like that, may be sustainable, but doesn't work in the classroom, if anyone has thought about that. Have you ever uh, tried to put that 5%, the, the value at zero instead of 20 to see if Yes, I have. I down? have. I have. And it didn't work at all. They don't because, go No. W what happens is most people don't understand shorting. So if I want to run a successful experiment, I try to always put the buy side. I've done the short side once, yeah. Yes? An area of the law that seems somewhat comparable is tax evasion and the research on tax evasion and whether or not it pays off. Have you looked at any of, did you, did you go there at all? And if not, why? I mean, it seems very uh, relatable. I have been thinking about tax evasion for a long time. Uh, you to do a research on tax evasion, I would have to leave my job here and uh, and have to take about a five or six year sabbatical on with the IRS and people. So, and there are a lot of other people doing that. So, the academics with the IRS having clearances doing research on tax evasion. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a completely different research agenda, but that's where this would also be very applicable. Yes. Have you seen any of these uh, corrupt economies improve or in reverse? Are there any that are getting worse? Over the years? Yes. It's difficult for me to say. Uh, when you say improve means improve in what sense? Like in all dimensions in the like, country. There's a like political dimension. There's a Stock markets have uh, improved uh, almost everywhere. They have become more efficient. There's a lot more trading. There's a lot more debt. In terms of corruption, 
Well, if you measure corruption using just bid and ask spreads, bid and ask spreads are narrowed. But that doesn't mean much. So people may still be manipulating the prices or something like that. But stock markets have certainly improved all over the world. And, uh, and that's why the, so many US citizens and citizens of other developed countries invest in emerging markets. There's a lot more globalization taking place. And they wouldn't have done that had they been scared. But there's a huge dispersion though. So there are emerging markets which are very popular and emerging markets which are regarded as pariah. So there's a lot of cross-sectional dispersion. But in the time series, I have not been studying these global markets in the time series seriously, so I won't be able to answer that question. So there's no emerging market that you've seen that has basically targeted corruption or you know, are trying to reform their ways. In, in your experience, you haven't. No, well, because I just looked, I took a snapshot in the year 2000. I haven't gone back and looked at it, so I won't be able to answer that. I can only answer for the European Union, though, because I've been uh, referring some papers from there where they actually do these snapshots. So the European Union has been improving. That's because they have a, now a str strong enforcement action from Brussels. And so the European Union has been improving. But I do not know anything about other emerging markets. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the argument that corruption is perhaps inherently cultural and maybe not a function of development and income? Um, I, I know you, you've mentioned uh, the European Union, but it's hard for me to imagine that anything's gotten better in places like... That's Canada a dangerous Europe. question, where the corruption is linked with cultural and I would not like to give an answer one way or the other. <laughs> That's very I, just, I just figured it may. But, know, but, it but may my mind. safe answer always has been that the most important determinant of corruption in a country is its GDP. So there's a very strong correlation between uh, GDP and corruption. And, and the reason is very simple, which is that if things are growing very fast, everyone's happy and they don't want to sleep. It's only when the pie is shrinking or is stagnant that's when people are thinking of redistributing and stealing from each other. Hmm. Yes. Uh, coming back to your slide where you're talking about earnings management yes, and uh, economic yeah. uh, first economic profits or earnings. Um, do you, I mean, I know you said that cash, the cash statement was what you were looking at. Yeah, yeah, as yeah, in yeah, like, yeah. You know, standing for economic earnings. Yeah. Uh, do you think that I mean, there's some improvement to be made there where, I mean, I mean, you so, yes, this you should ask from an accounting guy. They have made improvements. When we looked at the state of the art in the year uh, 2002, this was 2001, 2001. So what they, so this is the reported earnings. This is the operating profits, operating cash profits. Mm -hmm. And the belief was that uh, cash is difficult to manipulate and accruals is. Sure. So therefore this they believe is the truth. Now, from I've read two or three accounting papers after that, they have improved on that dimension. So some of the cash they think is discretionary also, they have tightened it. Mm -hmm. But since you can't observe the truth, you have to take something as a process. Sure. Yeah. Yes. What's your suggestion for an improvement? Well, I, I guess I really don't have any, any great answer. Because I was like thinking about like the loss of avoidance graph where you tend towards zero. Yeah. And that could be a, I mean, any number of you know, high growth companies that are looking to... You know, yes, they, so they, they control for all of that. So I've just given a snapshot. But on the right-hand side of the regression equation that Mike ran for us, mm -hmm. we have about 16 control variables. Okay. So high growth and the industry controls and things like that. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. Have you presented this on, in your, on your teaching internationally? Yes, I have actually. It and taken? It's taken very well. They see the place where people just didn't get it uh, was J Japan. Because I think he asked a difficult question, it's a cultural thing. I think there's something about uh, Japan after the Second World War and what Douglas MacArthur did with them. Uh, the corruption in Japan is at the the top level, I mean, so the, but the people corruption I think is very minimal. So they, for example, when I presented them that you should not pass a law unless you mean to enforce it, they scratched their heads and they said, why would you pass a law if you don't mean to enforce it? 
So therefore, it, it, so the relevance of corruption in, at that a student level wasn't that much in Japan, unless they had gone and traveled to the poorer countries around. And uh, in everywhere else, it was very relevant. And the funny thing in the United States was that I was doing this before Enron and WorldCom happened, and I was completely ignored. And after Enron and WorldCom happened, it seemed there was a regime shift here. And now everyone's interested in this stuff. Anything else? Okay, sorry, I can't answer that culture question. That's okay. That's okay. I understand you're on video. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.